A mitzvah is a good deed. It's also a commandment. But it is taking something broken and fixing it. It is the business of Tikam Olam, fixing the world. Are we ever going to make it a perfect place? Oh, no. We're not going to do that, not in this realm. Amen? We're going to have an opportunity after the, after the uh, during the millennium, we'll have plenty of opportunity for that. But listen to this. Joshua 22, Joshua says this, Take great care to obey the mitzvah and the Torah, which Moshe, the servant of Adonai, gave you, to love Adonai your God, follow all his ways, observe his mitzvahs, cling to him, and serve him with all your heart and being. That's what Yeshua was about. Mitzvah means a commandment, it means a deed, but listen to this. It comes from a root Hebrew word that means attachment or connection. Yes. The root for mitzvah, mitzvah is a commandment, it's something you need to be doing, but it comes from a root that means attachment or connection. A mitzvah creates a bond between God who commands and man who performs. I don't do a mitzvah to earn anything from God. But when I do a mitzvah, I am bonded to him. I'm connected to him. There's a smile on his face. He pokes an angel and says, see what my son is doing? See what my daughter is doing? Come on. When you're in the pits, when the devil's thrown everything at you and the Holy Spirit whispers to you, listen, get out of yourself. Get up. Go across the, the street. Bring a luncheon to that, that widow over there because you don't know whether she's eaten for three days, bring her lunch, but more than that, bring her yourself, sit down and eat it with her, and smile at her, and have a sweet conversation, and then come back. And you go do that. The devil is just like, oh, I can't believe it. Why? Because the minute you did that, you and God are bonded. Mm. You're on a God assignment. In the midst of all the hell the devil's put in your life, you're on a God assignment. You're doing a good deed. And the church too long, they say, oh, well, you know, those, those good little deeds that people did and brushed them aside. What did Yeshua say? Anyone who breaks the least of the mitzvahs and tells other people it's okay to do that is going to be least in the kingdom of God. And anyone who strives to keep the mitzvahs and encourages and teaches others how to do those mitzvahs will be called great in the kingdom of God. I don't want to be on the side, nor should you, of becoming least because we kind of belittle the mitzvahs. My, 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 my. The sages teach us, can you give me a few more minutes? The sages teach us two aspects of a mitzvah. One is the relationship of the mitzvah to the person doing it. Every mitzvah act, by virtue of its being the fulfillment of a divine command, Creates that link. Creates that link. Creates that link. When, 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 you, when you put on tzitzit, that's a mitzvah. Because God said, wear the tzitzit as a, as a reminder of who you are. But, but that creates a link. I'm linked. I'm linked to my covenant partner. When I tithe, that's a mitzvah. When I give, that's a mitzvah. When we go over uh, to Tiberias and I stand there and I'll show you the picture sometime with a rabbi in that kindergarten and I hand him a check for whatever it was, $1,000, $1,500. That's a mitzvah. Several things happen in the middle of that. Watch what happens. Scott, come here a minute. Big Scott. Watch this. Stand up there. There's a rabbi standing there and I say, we have a check for you. What happens? I am connected to my heavenly father doing a good deed. So Abba and I are now connected and I'm holding the check and he's holding the other side. Come on, we all know about what happens in quantum physics and impartation, and he's holding, and I'm holding. I'm not letting go. Yeah. Impartation is taking place. I am, because I'm doing a mitzvah, I'm a direct connection with Almighty God here. Thank you. There's something that happens. I become a partner with God. I, I, you know, I rarely give, give money when people in the street ask for it because I know what most people do with it. But if God tells me to, I will. Cameron, come up here a minute. But if, if all of a sudden God tells me, you know, okay, uh, you know that person, I, I want you to give them 
Here's what, you know, I'm telling no, I'm not going to give it. The guy's going, no, I said, the Holy Spirit said, I'll tell you what, and I'll, I'll, I'll reach for my wallet. Well, the minute I reach for my wallet, he's not looking at me anymore. <laughs> he's now looking at the wallet. You know, and, and, and I'll, I don't happen to have a 20 with me, but if I, oh, I really could get someone's attention if I pulled out the 100, huh? There's a 100 in there today. So I, I, I pull out the 10, and the minute, the minute I got it in my hand, what does he do? Reach for it. He reaches for it. I mean, he's not going to wait till I give it. I've never found a person in the street ever wait. Now, what do they think is going to happen? Here's what they think is going to happen. Reach for it. That's what they, that's what they think is going to happen. Here's what I do. I say, so, and I've got my hand on it. Now, he's pulling. I can feel he's pulling on that 10. And that's exactly what they do. They pull, and they're shocked because I'm not letting go, okay? Now I got their attention. Now they're not looking at this. They're looking at me because they're wondering what's going on. I said, do you realize what this money is? This is anointed money. This is money from God. My heavenly Father told me to give that to you. This is blessed money. It's meant to bless you, not for booze, not for drugs. It's meant, this is God's money, and God's going to hold you accountable for what you do with it. So be blessed. Then I let go. Amen. But it's, it's amazing, you know, they... They never expect me to hold on to them. But why? There's an attachment. I was doing that long before I read what the rabbis say, that, that we're attached as a person to God. But secondly, the second part is, the mitzvah to the material things, there's an attachment there. We make things holy. Now understand what holy is. Holy is, oh, it's holy. Let's, you know, this is a holy Bible. Oh, can't write in it, can't read. I mean, it's Holy, let's put it somewhere and worship it. No, no, no. Holy means set apart, not ordinary. Okay? So when we do something in a physical realm, and it's a mitzvah, there's an impartation. Get hold of this. You take food to that widow. It's not, it's not food. It's not fish. It's not chicken. It's not vegetables. It's food impregnated with the very life of God. I prayed over it. I speak into it that it might be nourishment to her body and her life. Come on. You, see, Chris, we've been playing around with this stuff too long. Donna keeps saying this phrase over the past six months. This stuff is real. And some of you, what do you mean this stuff is real? It's real. Blessings are real. Get out of the natural. They're real. They're tangible. When you bless a child, it goes into them. Don't go in the hospital, then visit somebody and just say, well, I just came to say hi. Hope you're feeling better. Bye. Touch them. Impart to them. How are you doing? I want you to know that we're in favor of your success. My words are imparting. My touch is imparting. When you're doing a mitzvah, everything about it is bringing it in. Amen? Going to Israel is a mitzvah. Going to Washington, D.C. is a mitzvah. It's a mitzvah. Well, don't go there and act like a tourist. Don't go there and just sit through meetings. Go and impart. Go and impart. Now, if you change your job from an attitude of a job into an attitude of an assignment by God, it becomes a mitzvah. If it's just a job, it's just a job. You work for so many hours, you get paid so much per hour, it's a contract between you and them. Oh, no, 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 wait a minute. You're not my boss. This is my boss. And he assigns me where to go. And he opened a door for me to work with you. So therefore, uh, that is part of that preordained work. Now my job becomes part of a preordained work of God, a mitzvah, and now I'm imparting into it changes the whole atmosphere of what happens. You still with me in this? My, 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 my. Uh, let me, I want to read two things to you. And then we're going to close. Listen to this. This is a, a cute one. The joy of a mitzvah. The two brothers, the famed Rabbi Elimech of Linsky and Rabbi Zushi of Annapoli, often wandered about together posing as simple beggars. They would mingle with the masses, listening, teaching, speaking, helping and guiding whomever and whenever they could. Once while traveling with a group of vagabonds, members of the group were accused of being thieves, resulting in the entire bunch being thrown into jail. Confident of their innocence and eventual release, the two brothers sat quietly. As the afternoon progressed, Rabbi Elimech 
stood up to prepare himself to pray the afternoon service. What are you doing, his brother asked. I'm getting ready for Mikha, replied Rabbi Elimech. The same God who commanded you to pray commanded you not to pray in a room unfit for prayer. Dear brother, advised Rabbi uh, Zushi, it is forbidden to pray in this cell because there's a pail that serves as a toilet nearby, making the room unfit for prayer. Dejected, the holy Rabbi Elimech sat down. Soon after, Rabbi Elimech began to cry. Why are you crying, said Rabbi Zushi. Is it because you're unable to pray? Rabbi Elimech answered affirmatively. But why weep, continued Rabbi Zushi. Don't you know that the same God who commanded you to pray also commanded you not to pray when the room is unfit to prayer. By not praying in this room, you've achieved a connection with God. See, a mitzvah is not just doing things. When you don't do something he tells you not to do, that is a mitzvah. When you don't do what he says, don't do that, and you don't do it, that's a mitzvah. You're connected. Continue. Don't you know that the same God who commanded you to pray also commanded you not to pray when the room is unfit for prayer? By not praying in this room, you have achieved a connection with God. True, it is not the connection you had sought, yet if you truly want the divine connection, you would be happy that God has afforded you the opportunity to obey His law at this time, no matter what. You are right, my brother, exclaimed Rabbi Elimech, suddenly smiling. The feelings of dejection banished from his heart and mind. Rabbi Elimech took his brother's arm and began to dance from joy as a result of performing the mitzvah of not praying in an inappropriate place. The guards heard the commotion and came running. Witnessing the two brothers dancing with their long beards and flowing tzitzit, the guard asked the other prisoners what had happened. We have no idea, they answered, mystified. Those two Jews were discussing the pail in the corner when all of a sudden they came to some happy conclusion and began to dance. Is that right? sneered the guards. They're happy because of the pail, are they? We'll show them. They promptly removed the pail from the cell and the holy brothers were able to pray their, pray their afternoon prayer. <laughs> I mean, you know, you rejoice always. And again, I say rejoice. Now, on a more serious note, when I was a 20 year old yeshiva, this is obviously someone other than me. When I was a 20 year old yeshiva student, we received a strange request. An Israel Day fair was being planned, and the directors approached us to be part of the show. They were setting up exhibits demonstrating various facets of Jewish life and they wanted a pair of Talmudic students to sit up on a stage swaying and studying to give attendees a vignette of authentic Torah study. Our dean refused to allow any of us to attend. He explained that he would be more than willing to send boys to mingle with the masses or to put on tefillim with people or to teach Torah to the crowd but to fulfill the request the way it was couched was demeaning and self-defeating. Yeshiva students aren't museum pieces to be put up on show and then packed away when the tent comes down at night. Religious people are not quaint throwbacks to a bygone age, but are living representatives of a vibrant culture. You can't admire Torah study from a distance. You've got to roll up your sleeves of your mind and get into the logic to truly appreciate it. God promises us an abundance of blessing if we walk in my ways and guard my mitzvahs to do them. It is not enough just to guard the mitzvahs, placing them on a pedestal, treating them with care, dusting them on schedule. You've got to actually do them. God doesn't want admirers. He wants participants. There is nothing sadder than walking into people's homes and seeing their godfather's tefillim or the bubba's candlesticks standing forlornly on display in the brec breakfast room. Is this veneration or oblivion? It would be a far greater posthumous honor for our loved ones if we took the objects they venerated down from the shelf, gave them a polish and a promise and commitment to living their dreams ourselves. 
I'm going to read two more quotes to you from In the Footsteps of Rabbi, the Rabbi from Tarsus, and with that we'll close. Um, Jeffrey Seif wrote, it, writes an excellent book about understanding Paul uh, as a Jewish man in terms of, of what he believes and everything. But his introduction to the book, <laughs> just his introduction to the book, dealing with what's going on in the contemporary church is very poignant. Listen to this. Many in our churches are either ignorant of the essential requirements of authentic biblical faith and practice, or are aware but simply not interested in practicing the faith they claim and ostensibly embrace. Some may have known a small part of the teaching of scriptures at one point, but over time authentic faith and practice tragically drifted from the thought and application into distant memories. Being salt and light in the world to actually affect and guide perplexed people is apparently of primary importance to Yeshua, despite its diminished popularity in our constellation of conflicted, self-centered concerns. Simply going to church is not a sufficient basis to assess one's Christian life and contribution to the kingdom of God. Unadulterated kindness toward others, however, apparently does factor significantly in Yeshua's economy. How authorities employ power enjoys special consideration in Hebrews. How believers treat others generally merits special concern in Hebrews and in Matthew and in other places as well. Now listen to this. People need a biblical worldview to be saved from a dysfunctional process of just going to church. The expression going to church, which is typically used for attending Sunday morning services, betrays a serious deficiency in our thinking. In scripture, a church is not a place where stained glass windows, pipe organs, collection boxes and pews, but church is a community. It is a social relationship between individuals who are giving up on selfish individualities, false hopes, who are ever increasing, moving to levels to invest their personal energy and resources in community-oriented Christian faith and practice. An indication of this is how people used to speak of their congregation as their church home, now an anachronistic expression. Perhaps we ought to speak instead of our church apartment. Odd though it sounds, this may be more correct. Though there are some exceptions, apartments tend to be rented by individuals needing a temporary place who don't want the commitments and responsibilities of home ownership. Leases tend to be as short term as possible. People want in with as little down as possible. Apartment dwellings most often are briefly inhabited by people until they can find something that will better serve their evolving needs and restless interests. Church apartment may be more accurate and descriptive than church home, but this still may be granting too much stability to socially inept Western Christians. Sad to say, people might speak even more accurately if they referred to their church hotel. And why is that? The present stay in a church for many Americans is extremely short. Like hotel lodgers, they feel entitled to make a mess, expecting someone else to come and clean it up after they have moved on in their restless quest for another place to temporarily dwell to a more perfect church. Does the problem lie with the church, or is it in the mind? of the restless seeker. Then he goes, <laughs> not here, not here. And then he goes on to address the issue that we're talking about today, that Christian faith is meant to be an act of faith. It's not what you believe. It's what are you doing. People can walk in and visit our church and say, well, what do you believe here? Well, what do you mean by that question? Do you want to know what I believe? Do you want to know what Donna and I believe? Do you want to know what we believe? I don't have a clue what we believe, because I don't know what all of you believe. You surprise me every once in a while, you know? And, and, and so, you know, it's like, we're not a church. So, well, what do you believe? Well, 
I got 22 beliefs you'd line up with, but this 23rd belief, uh, 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 out. It's not about belief. Sure, there's got to be basic beliefs. Is Jesus Lord or not? I mean, is the Bible the Word of God or not? We all know that. Let's be commonsensical about that. The question is, what are you doing? What are you doing every day when you get up to say, God, you've got a plan for me today. Before the foundation of this world today, there's an appointment here somewhere. I might have the right word. I might only have the right smile. It might be letting somebody pass in front of me. It might be that I actually do something. It might be a coworker who suddenly says, I'm just overwhelmed, and you go and say, can I help? What is the mitzvahs that you have for me to do? Well, I'll pray more, and I'll be more. No, no, no. What are you going to do with your life? So that at the end, you and I stand before Yeshua, and he says, I know your deeds. I know your mitzvahs. They've preceded you into the kingdom, and I reward you. Well done. Well done. Not well thought, well believed. No, no, no. Well done. Good and faithful servant.